Thank you, Dawn and Choir. That is a perfect song to begin our season of Advent together. As the first candle reminds us, we are beginning our journey towards Bethlehem as we walk that way over the next four Sundays and through Christmas Eve. Next Sunday is a big day in that journey together. And I just want to say an extra word or two about that as we begin this morning. The song that you heard this morning is from the musical uh, that will be presented next Sunday morning and will be a big part of our service together. We invite you to come. Bring your friends for that as well. That's a wonderful, uh, non-threatening way to invite people in to hear good music to celebrate the season, but also hear the good word of the gospel presented through what is sung. And we, we celebrate that. In the afternoon, our, our parents will get the opportunity to drop kids by and spend some time together, do some of the things you may not get to do otherwise, but also during that time at 3 o'clock, we share in what is an annual tradition for us here, and that is our service of hope. I, for many people in this room, I know this last year has not been an easy year. We've had lots of losses uh, in our families, our extended families, and lots of life transitions, and lots of difficulties. And the service that we share in each year on the, uh, the second Sunday of Advent is a uh, very informal but meaningful service designed for those who have experienced loss, whether it's one that's been with you for some time and is dominant, or perhaps this is your first Christmas without somebody significant in your family or marking a significant life change in your own vocation or health or other things. Whatever that is, we invite you to come be with friends and to know that in those moments you are not alone that we are fortunate to be able to come together and share uh, a good word, a good word of hope that uh, Emmanuel truly is God with us, even in the most difficult moments of all. And we celebrate that. Thankful for our kids this morning and the great job. Aren't they cute? I tell you, it's just, uh, and talented, it's just, it's just amazing. And as I'll say more about later in our service, we cannot pour enough into our children and our families and, and what that means. Well, how many of you have already made a visit somewhere or had somebody visit you for the holiday season to kick it off this week? Have you got some planned in the days ahead? I remember as a kid, long before the days of uh, cell phone where it didn't cost an arm and a leg to call and you didn't just jump and go someplace all the time, those special moments of visitation when you show up at a family member's home or somebody pulls up in your driveway and you wait with that expectation that comes, those became the highlighted moments of Christmas that I have remembered now for all of these years. We got to share in some of those this weekend. Between Lisa and myself, we divided and conquered, and we had four Thanksgiving meals between us uh, in different places. Uh, I did not consult my cardiologist on that, uh, but I can greatly report that to the best of my knowledge, not a single turkey died in vain. I mean, they were, they were all prepared well and eaten well, and uh, it was a great thing to share in those visitations and to, to be there with the people you love and to hear those words that we say to each other, I love you. It's so good to see you. And to share in that deep, heartfelt message that comes that says just what we need to hear. The theme over these next few weeks for us as we walk through Advent is just that. The theme is, as you see above us, visitations. Those wonderful ways that God showed up. And it's, uh, it is interesting. You know the stories, and oftentimes we don't weave them together all the way through. But beginning as we will today with Zechariah when the angel Gabriel arrived and when Joseph received a visit from the angel, it says, fear not. Mary received a visit and explained in detail what was going to happen, and more importantly, what it meant. How Elizabeth received the good news through her own... Uh, Pregnancy of giving birth to uh, the cousin of Jesus, but also the forerunner. How the shepherds in their field 
and the angels that we have heard on high we sang about earlier today just showed up in unexpected visitation. And then the Magi who showed up, not at the manger sometime later, but yet who came bearing gifts, seeking the king to recognize. This morning's text, we look in Luke's gospel in the first chapter. And share with me as I read this part of the story, the first visitation. As I do this, I want you to keep in mind, uh, Zechariah is a priest. He and his wife, uh, Elizabeth, we find that they're of the line of Aaron, uh, deeply devout and faithful people. Uh, He goes into, as we're about to read, into the temple, and a miraculous visitation happens. Also keep in mind that this is the second time in biblical history where God breaks a centuries-long silence. 400 years of waiting for God to speak. And then here it is. In the time of Herod, the king of Judah, there was a great priest named Zechariah. He belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, and his wife was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in their years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, keep in mind this is like a a once-in-a-lifetime experience for one of thousands of priests to have their opportunity to to be serving uh, in this capacity. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And then an angel of the Lord appeared. That divine visitation It appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Some of the most beautiful and powerful and comforting words of Scripture follow, though we often miss it. He says this, your prayer has been heard. What would it mean for all of us if we could audibly hear and affirm that the nearest and dearest and most powerful and intimate prayer of our heart has indeed been heard? Your your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. And he will be a joy and a delight to you, and and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. And many of the people of Israel will bring bring back to the Lord their God. He will bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Is that not the echo back to Abraham and Sarah? And the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent, not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. Now, tucked away in that story for us, this visitation is a beautiful picture of what God was up to in those days, and it speaks to us as well today. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's set within a context. There is a, a, a political context of what's going on in that day. 
Herod is the king. He's on the throne. And what we know of Herod is that uh, he was not a good guy. Uh, it was Herod who was so jealous and so fearful that somebody would take his, his uh, place on the throne that he carried out a genocide. It was, it was said that it was safer to be a pig in Herod's herd than to be a child in Herod's kingdom because it was, it was so evil uh, and so self-absorbed. Uh, he would draw the parallel that these were righteous people but they were living in a troubled time. Here we had a godly priest who was serving in the time of an evil king. It was a time of uh, a cacophony of noise in the world around them based out of the fear and the chaos and the confusion. Yet, as I said earlier, against the backdrop of 400 years of God being silent. The other time in the Old Testament that we find, Old Testament uh, part of this, is we find that after the Tower of Babel, or as our British friends would say, the Tower of Babel, when, uh, when God confused all the people and he scattered them and said, uh, I, can't, I can't do what I want to do with people of this mindset uh, that are self-absorbed uh, and missing the point of my whole mission. And he confused them and he sent them and scattered them out throughout the world. And then things go quiet until the day that God says, okay, I'm ready to pick up again. And he finds a caravan owner by the name of Abraham out in Ur of the Chaldees, and he invites him into his mission to be the father of a great nation against all odds, against the odds of age and a barren wife and all of these things, which sounds a lot like what we hear in Zechariah. After the prophet Malachi in the very last book of the Old Testament, and frankly one of the more interesting and powerful of the minor prophets, God goes quiet. Then he shows up and he speaks. And the silence of God is somehow mirrored by the silence of Zechariah because of his own disbelief. Now you see each of the visitations that we're going to look at had a theme. The visitation to Zechariah, to Joseph, to Mary, to Elizabeth, to the shepherd, and then to the Holy Family with the Magi. But the theme of this visitation is promise. Because the angel showed up to give a promise that spoke into the spirit of doubt that was living, not just in Zechariah, but in the people. See, the Bible's full of promises. Somebody way smarter and has way more time on their hands than me figured out once that there's over 8,800 promises in the Bible. And the vast majority of those are uh, from God to his people. And that there are books in the Bible that contain hundreds of promises, in, in, particularly in some of the Old Testament prophets. And there are some of the Psalms that literally have a promise in, in just about every single verse. God is in the business of speaking promise into, uh, into ears that are given to doubt. Is that your story and mine? Pretty good chance it is. Pretty good chance that we want to see things happen, but we, we have our doubts. I really wanted Florida State to win yesterday. But I had my doubts, and uh, they were confirmed. You know, we hope for the best, but we live prepared for the worst. We, we, we desire uh, what we beg and what we ask for. Sometimes it comes through, sometimes it doesn't, and we wonder, what's, what's happening in that? Do I dare have the trust to put my faith into God's promises? And here we were, here we are listening to an angel of God. Get this, he's doubting, how can I believe this? And Gabriel kind of says, take a look, I'm an angel. I'm from God, I'm here. You know, that's pretty believable stuff. I sure wish God would speak to me like that, don't you? But here we find that the word from Gabriel comes clear to Zechariah. 
One, that God was promising to do a miracle. Zechariah was a priest. He knew all the stories of the miracles. He knew the miracle of parting of the Red Sea. He knew the miracle of the birth of, of Abraham's son. He knew the miracle of how rain came down from heaven to, to, uh, for Elijah to show the presence of God. He knew miracle after miracle after miracle. And Gabriel says to him, I'm about to do something that fits into that category. It was significant also because of the name, John. The name which means God is gracious. Zechariah hears the word of Gabriel says, remember the character of God. Remember we talked about that last week? How important it is that you understand the character of God and you live in that, that trust. But also he says, this, this son of yours is going to be a great, great man. Now wouldn't you love it if you just knew from the beginning that your child was destined for greatness? I mean, we all want that and believe that. I mean, how many of us haven't watched our kid go one plus one equals two and go, he's the next Einstein, we know he will be. That's the way parents do, you know, we, we, we go with that. But he says, this child is destined for greatness. Maybe a word we throw around too, too easy today. But to call somebody great, because they're great in the sight of the Lord is a whole different thing. One of my favorite stories, and you know, pastors have a lot of them we've heard over the years, was about the guy whose brother died. And his brother, let's face it, was a scoundrel. He was a rascal. Uh, he, he, he was given to about every vice you can imagine. Uh, he was mean. He was exploitive. And frankly, the world was probably better off without him in the community he lived in. He was just that kind of person. But his brother came to the pastor and said, I'll tell you what, pastor, I want you to do my brother's funeral. And I'm going to pay you a $5,000 honorarium. I'll get your attention. If you will just say, that my brother was a great man. And so he thought about it, and he thought about it, and he says, man, $5,000 just to say he's a great man, and here's the truth. So he steps into the pulpit on the day of the funeral with the casket laying right in front of him, and he stood there, and he swallowed hard, and he thought for a minute, and he said, um, brother so-and-so is dead. He was, he was trouble. He fought. He, he was a drunkard, he was unfaithful, he, he was a cheat, he was a liar, he was about everything you can imagine. But compared to his brother, he was a great man. Wonder if he got the check. Gabriel is saying here, your son's going to be a great man. He's going to be a great man because he's filled with the Spirit. He's going to be a great man because he's going to be a great preacher with a great following. He's going to be a great man because he literally is going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And this is, after all, what you'd prayed for. And uh, tucked away in this text, I wish I had more time to spend with it, was something I had missed over all these years. It's amazing how you can study a text, you can preach a text, and stuff just flies by you was the fact that the things that he came to address, one had to do with family responsibilities, where fathers turn their attention toward their children, and we take seriously the spiritual development of our children and prioritize that in our life. The fulfillment of family responsibilities was something John the Baptist came to address. He came to address righteous living, to turn people toward the righteous, uh, towards wise living in ways that honors God. And help the people be ready to be blessed. So, Jer uh, Zechariah is the recipient of this great news. Over the years, I'm sure he struggled to feel blessed. The priest who, whose wife was barren and believing in a culture that children were a blessing from God and perhaps they weren't as blessed and faithful as they thought. They carried that burden with them and that hurt as so many families do even today. 
that Gabriel says, this is all going to be answered. But he left him mute. You can't tell anybody. Isn't it, isn't it painful when you've got great news and you can't tell anybody? When you have a secret and you, you, can't, uh, you can't let it out, you want to, but you can't. You know, it's it's kind of like the cruelness of the Baptist preacher who skipped church one Sunday morning, called in sick, and went golfing. Got a hole in one. Who's he going to tell? You know, I mean, it's to have great news. And then what do, you, what do you do with that? Well, that's where we find Zechariah. Zechariah, who was confident in God's plan of redemption, he prayed for it. And now, is it not only coming true, He's going to be a part of it. So is his wife, and so is his son. The question for us this morning is, what have you been praying for? If God were to say to you, your prayer has been heard, what would it be? And are you confident that God is at work in your heart, in your life, in the world around you? And are we praying to that end? My hope and my prayer is that we are. Another interesting thing, he left him silent. Because that gives you time to think. It's amazing how much more you can think and listen when you can't talk. That's where we find him. Well, in these next few moments, we're going to share in communion. And communion is typically a time is when the organ plays behind us and we share the cup and we share the bread. It is a time of silence. But I pray for you in your seat that in your heart and in your mind it will be a time of prayer and a time of pondering about the good news of what God is doing in your heart, in your life. And to know that your prayer is being heard. Let's pray together as we prepare to do just that. Father, we thank you for the first story of visitation. We ask you, Lord, come to our heart as well. Afresh and anew, even as we tell the old, old story in as best we can, new, new ways. Let us be aware of what you are doing through the bread of life and the cup of salvation that we received this morning. And may we pray, may we ponder, may we know and believe that you are up to a good and redemptive work in this world and in our heart and in our lives. And may we pray hard to that end and trust that our prayers are heard and answered. For us in the strong, strong, strong name of Jesus, we make this prayer. Amen.